Hey guys, I just want to let you know before we get into this episode that we've partnered with Band Builder Academy. Band Builder Academy is the number one place to grow your music career. Run by top label manager and Sony Vice President Todd McCarthy. So, you know it's worth it. Enter promo code CONCERTS at checkout to receive 10% off membership. What's up guys? We Doom Trigger. Please tune in to Concert That Made Us. Have a listen to what we're all about. They rocking. Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The show is about to begin. Welcome to the podcast. Concerts that made us Interviews and stories Tales from the bus We love taking you back To when it all went down The greatest live shows And that cheering crowd sound It's concerts, concerts that made us Concerts that made us Dot com On this episode I'm joined by Robbie and Kenny From Doom Trigger Have you ever wondered what South African metal sounds like? Well, you're about to find out. We chat about everything that is Doom Trigger. So, sit back, relax, and let's get on with the show. Robbie and Kenny, you're very welcome to Concerts That Made Us. Thank you so much. So we kicked off the episode with your song Fierce Rivals. Would you like to tell us a bit about it? Um, maybe, I think Kenny, Kenny is probably the better one to chat about Fierce Rivals. Um, 
It's it's funny because that's actually the the one track that that wasn't quite ready when we went into studio to record the first EP. I, I had written a you know set of material um, during the height of lockdown period, and fast forward to us being an established band, you know, a year and a half later, we went into studio with three fully completed songs and one like half half complete song and. Um, I wasn't convinced that it, it, you know, was ready or even should have been considered for the EP. And it was actually our drummer that like really just pushed and said, no, we have to, we have to do it. We, we, we have to have this track on and we, we have to have four tracks on the EP. And he actually came up with, I think it was two extra drum parts that he just like threw into, into, into the mix. I don't know where like he, he, he conceived that from, but he, he literally just started playing parts and out came this drum track and I just wrote like two extra riffs for the two uh, empty drum parts and then out came the song. And yeah, we just, we, we, we wrote the, the, the chorus vocals in studio as well. The, the lyrics for the song had been written by Jason previously. The kind of concept of the song is this, this constant battle, like personal battle between like good and evil like the angel on the one shoulder and the demon on, on the other shoulder, and you kind of this vessel that's being pulled between the two. Uh, so, you know, this good and evil is kind of fierce rivals at each other. Yeah, that, that track was actually, I mean, half of it was like completed in, in the studio. And I think it's probably one of our strongest, if not strongest song in terms of, I suppose, general appeal and commercial appeal i think it's you know i think for ken is right from the commercial standpoint is definitely it has nice beats to it so uh so i think everyone enjoys the beats the guitarists are very heavy also and it's got some clean vocals in there in the mix so i think you know from the commercial standpoint it's always interesting to me when you go into studio um and you have maybe six songs or four songs or five songs ready to go and the one that that's not quite ready to go <laughs> ends up with 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 just uh, you know it's brainstorming in studio uh, something great comes up you know so, um, so 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 that seems to happen quite often you know it's funny how things like that happened though. I even noticed with the with the podcast there's been episodes where like there's been technical difficulties or maybe in the moment I didn't feel like it was a great conversation even but then that episode goes on to like do better than other episodes it's kind of funny the way those things work out yeah there's something about like having to to like immediately find like something natural in either the conversation to your point or you in music like all of a sudden when something like really comes up organically or, or naturally it tends to be really good uh as opposed to something that's forced and like you know, I didn't want to, back to the point of that song, I didn't want to go sit down and write, you know, this, or complete the song because it felt forced. And so when the drummer actually said, well, here's, here's the beat, and here, you know, lays it down, and then, like, everything just came naturally from that. So I think there's something that just goes to show, like, the more organic, the better. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And the song, it really does rock. It's, uh, you know, it's one of them ones that when it comes on, it's like you've heard it before almost. It just clicks with you and you're like, yeah, this is oh, that's awesome, great, man. you know? Yeah, and cool. it's off your EP, Enter the Cosmic. What was the process like with that from conception all the way up to release? Yeah, look, I think, um, again, it was, I think it was more of a personal journey uh, for, for me personally when, when writing that material. So, Initially, this wasn't intended to be a full band. Um, I, I think just maybe to to keep some sanity and to use all of the you know forced confined time we had during the lockdown period, use it as a channel of outlet. And you know, I enjoyed writing so much that I, I just decided I'm gonna I'm gonna make a solo project of it and eventually take the material to studio and you know release it under whatever pseudonym or alias, you know, I, I would decide on, on that time. But it wasn't until um, I actually reconnected with our vocalist, Jason, um, and said, like, let's, let's do a single together because your voice is perfect for this, this type of music. Um, 
And yeah, we did the single together, got a session drummer on board. Um, I doubled down on, on bass and guitars and out came this product, which just sounded incredible. And I think in that moment, I realized and Jason also knew that like it could be something uh, more permanent and could be a full-fledged band. And we, we obviously set about finding the right people, uh, roped Robbie in. Funny enough, I was soundboarding a lot of these riffs and ideas to him on WhatsApp, like, because he knew about this this thing I was working on just, you know, as a personal project. But this guy is probably the biggest metalhead I know um, <laughs> and listens to, to literally every metal band known to man. So I, I knew he was the right guy to soundboard, like, riff ideas and stuff. I'm like, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? And so when I eventually approached him and roped him in onto the bass, it wasn't unfamiliar to him and he kind of knew what he was getting into, which was awesome. But I think the... The concept of, of Enter the Cosmic, when we speak of cosmos, it's not necessarily like space and, and time only. It's also like a metaphysical uh, metaphor. Uh, you know, the, the cosmic can also be something that's, that's beyond understanding or, you know, behind, uh, uh, beyond like human conception. And so the themes of the song speak to things that are beyond our understanding, you know. So there's... Fierce Rivals, like I spoke about, this kind of push and pull between good and evil, which is something completely metaphysical. And some of the Reaper is about, you know, the uncomfortable reality and facing of death. Shark Attack is a little bit more political, speaks mm. to, you know, speaks to current state of affairs from, from a political point of view. And our leaders that are, you know, metaphorical sharks that just kind of attack us. And Night Terror, I think, is something that, it it's literally speaks about, you know, kind of horror in dreams. Uh, and, and, and I don't know if you've ever had a night terror, but there's quite a few scary concepts, um, you know, that, that kind of sit within that, within that um, experience. And, yeah, I think the song kind of, kind of speaks to that and tries to make sense of it because, again, it's like a phenomenon. So, so I guess that's, that's where it came from. Like a lot of the... The, the songs and the themes are, are really rooted in just being human and, and experiences and concepts that are completely beyond our understanding, but yet we are still faced to, you know, or, or expected to face it and to have, to, with have it, yeah. to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I have to ask, since you mentioned you were bouncing the ideas off of Robbie, were you kind of sitting back waiting for your moment to be asked to join the band <laughs> or how did that work out? <laughs> Listen, me and uh, Kenny actually played in a band together before before uh, Kenny started Doom Trigger. Um, so we know each other very well. And um, obviously, having performed live together, we understand our uh, each other's minds, you know. So um, so just from the from the base of it, uh, I think he he could get an honest opinion if he's gonna send me uh, some stuff, which I obviously he was looking for. Um, and then, you know, from the band perspective, I think, um, you know, I'm definitely not the most <laughs> talented musician. Let me put it that way. <laughs> I that music well. Um, I have some performance skill, if I can put it that way. So the additional vocals, I think, that I could add uh, along with the bass may have been the trigger for the ask at the end of the day uh, because I can do the cleans and the gutturals and the lows and the high screams. So I think um, I think from that standpoint, it could have turned into an edge, you know, uh, for them. So uh, so I think that's mainly where the R stem came from. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I always enjoy hearing how musicians got to where they are now. What was the point in your lives individually where you kind of thought to yourself, yeah, I want to give music a serious shot? I want to go for it. Probably, probably forever. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's every every person that makes music. I think that's that's a dream for for yeah. everyone. Yeah. Um, to 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 actually do it is a completely different story. Yeah. So, so so yeah, a lot of people. It obviously takes a lot a long time. It's not it's not uh, like winning the lottery. You know, <laughs> it's, it's not going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have to put a lot of time into it. Mm -hmm. um, me and Kenya is a bit older. Uh, than than Jason, who's the lead singer, who's who's what? How, how, he's like 26, 27. Yeah, so he's ten years younger than us. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, so he obviously um, uh, brings a lot of energy, and then myself and Kenny, with a little bit more experience, you know, we all, we both have families. The drummer uh, Frank also has a family, so vastly experienced. Like he comes yeah. more from a rock background. Yeah, it's funny. Him and I used to live together years ago and 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 he had his kit in the house and i had my rig in the house and we would come back from work and play slipknot covers like for two hours and you know he was i could see he was a phenomenal metal drummer at least from a potential point of view um and yeah he's like also really grown into his metal drumming and you can see it's like a whole new world for him that's unlocked and he's really enjoying it a lot but back to your your, your question i also think it depends on where you're situated in the world. So, you know, if you in a first world country or, you know, anywhere in Europe for that matter, uh, or in Northern America, and, and you want to give, you know, doing music um, for a living a shot and you've got a semi-decent product, like you've got a good shot at, you know, paying your bills and putting bread and butter on the table where, you know, where we are in South Africa, the, the, the market's super, super small, especially for, for, for the metal genre. So, you know, for, for, you, for a person to go make that decision and go like, I really want to give music a shot like that, that takes not only a big set of balls, but also a, a, some sort of a day job that you have as security to pay your bills. Otherwise, you, you're just not going to get it, unfortunately. And if you, if you do... It takes years. You, you have to really, really slog it out. So um, I think we've we've always, all of us have always, you know, dreamt of, of, of um, you know, doing music in some way, shape or form. Like I personally prom made a promise to myself, I'd never stop doing it. It doesn't matter what I do or how I do it, but I would always make music in some way, shape or form. And um, yeah, obviously when this, you know, when this kind of project came to life, I was just like, wow, we, we, we really have to give this a proper shot because it could be something, something special. And you know, we, we all also like established in our lives in, term of, in terms of jobs and stuff like that. And um, so, so that's kind of taken care of. All we need to do now is keep the high work, work ethic going, keep writing new, new, new music and, and try to play shows that are really, really energetic and appealing to the audience. You touched on something there about you know being in a band in South Africa I've said it on the podcast before I feel like bands musicians in South Africa deserve a lot more respect than you know say guys in England or America as you were saying it's easier now it's still incredibly hard to make it in those countries but I feel like you know in those countries you're starting off up here when you're just start but in South Africa you're starting down here and it's more of a fight and more of a battle to get recognized, you know? No, for sure. And there, and there's, there's many bands that could, you know, that are testament to that. They are absolutely unreal, awesome bands. <laughs> um, and obviously it's just oh, too tough to do it from, from South Africa. You need to be, or you need to commit to, to not do it from South Africa, really, if you want to make it. Um, you know, bands like, if I can just give an example, Chromium, uh, Pestroy. These are two legendary South African metal bands. Um, Incredible. And uh, <laughs> music's absolutely amazing. Um, but they don't fe feature much on the world scene, you know. So uh, so, so it is tough. You know, I think it's, it, it's becoming a bit easier to get the music out there. Mm. Obviously, uh, yes, back, back in those days, I'm talking 10 years ago, it, it was literally impossible. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could imagine. So on this point, it is easier to get get the music out there. I mean, anyone can, you know, get music out into publishing uh, platforms nowadays. But that also, in turn, makes it more difficult to cut through all of the potential noise. You know, so there's so much fucking music out there, so much that your know, your product's got to be. <laughs> of a Good. certain standard and class to, to at least get noticed. I mean, you know, that's why I really appreciate your comment earlier about saying like Fierce Rivals as an example is a song that when you hear it, you feel you, you've heard it before. Like that to me is amazing because that's, it's resonating with, with you and, and, you know, hopefully any other listener. And once you can start resonating with someone's mind uh, or, or, or emotionally, like then you're going to get some traction, you know, which is, which is good. So mm. 
um, yeah, I think if you can if you can try tap into that, then then you should be okay. Definitely. And what do you guys think goes into making a successful band? Just commitment from everyone. Yeah. Obviously, you need to get along. That's the first first yeah. part. So handy. Um, if you're not going to get along, it's going to be tough. Yeah. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, chemistry is definitely one part of it. Um, Work ethic, yeah, for sure. Everyone's got to do their bit, you know. Um, that, that's definitely another big part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I think originality as well is yes. another big piece. So, uh, and, and obviously, you know, a sprinkle of talent doesn't, doesn't hurt either. Um, but it's... I, I don't want to take away from, you know, the creative process of writing music, but it's relatively easy to string together a few chords, a few beats, a few bass lines, and, you know, a, a hooky chorus as an example. But it's another thing to really explore, you know, a little bit more technical song structures, uh, a little bit more diverse sound across your songs, a little bit more... Um, you know, unorthodox beats or unorthodox bass lines blended in with, with guitar. It's, it's just, you know, it's, you've, you've got to have that kind of element of originality when it comes to songwriting, because mm -hmm. otherwise you get stuck in a trap of sounding like anything and anyone else, you know, which is, again, I think we are kind of getting right. Um, you know, even, even all of the new stuff that we're writing is, is, is a good blend of, you know, exper um, experimental enough pieces of music and experimental enough pieces of instrumentation, but coupled with uh, an expected break or an expected chorus or an expected bridge. Um, and I think that's, it's important to get that balance right as well. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to ask there. It's uh, something that always fascinates me, you know, because as a band, you do want to be evolving and growing with each new record, but you don't want to be, you know, changing so much that you alienate fans. How do you approach that? How do you keep the sound just enough that the fans will love it, but, you know, you're showing them something new? No, I think we we obviously still relatively new, so we haven't had to add those battles yet uh, in terms of the change in, in sound. At the moment, you know, we, we, f we feel like I think we kind of find our niche um, so we're going to focus on, 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 you know, getting as much of that niche out as we possibly can. Uh, and when the time comes, then we'll obviously have to go into that debate of, of or what's, what's the next step or, or what's the next. But I think the very variation that we do have, which is tough for some bands, um, obviously, but, uh, you know, sometimes obviously you don't have all the elements. Um, sometimes it's, I don't want to say blank because it's not blank, but, you know, with us, you know, we have a lot of different elements going into it. You know, there's, especially from a vocal standpoint, there's, you know, Jason can do pretty much anything from a screaming standpoint that's known to man. Uh, I can do the screams. Kenny does the clean vocals. I can do the clean vocals. So just from the vocal standpoint, there's already uh, a lot of variations yeah. um, that's available to us, you know, um, and then obviously from the guitaring standpoint, myself and Kenny, but mostly Kenny obviously does most of the, the guitar riffs. Um, I just try to to <laughs> to basically uh, come off what he's come up with. Because <laughs> this guy can can throw some nasty stuff in there. So uh, so I'm just trying to keep up. But I think, yeah, we haven't had the problem. Oh, I shouldn't really say problem, but we haven't had to adjust really in, in terms of the sound. Mm -hmm. And it's not, I don't think it's gonna be very soon that we're going to have to do that just because of the like i said the the variation that we have available to us already you know what is nice to say is that um with, with the new stuff um and as we progress it's 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 a lot more uh collective uh, in terms of input so you know with, with the first record it was like okay here, here are the songs or here, here are the three and a half songs like learn them and we record them and you know out comes the, the product so with this it's like here's a riff and here's another riff. Okay, what should we do? And then, you know, Robbie will, for instance, say we need a bridge and we need to repeat that section and we need to do X, Y, Z. And, you know, Etty and our drummer will come up with, with a suggestion or, 
Jason will come to us and say, I really want to do this in a song. Can we write around that concept or that part or whatever? So in terms of that, it's been a, a really nice, like collaborative approach. And we're actually going into studio at the end of September to, to track the, the second EP. So we, 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 we've done and completed that. And uh, yeah, we're pretty excited about that. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. We'll, uh, We'll get to that just before we finish so the, the listeners can get the, the up-to-date info on it. But um, at this point, I usually ask, as concert goers and concerts you've attended yourselves, what concerts do you think have made you? That's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. Listen, I, I, I did travel to, to Europe once just for for three days literally in and out to go to download festival um which i thought was absolutely epic um and i spent seven years in the us where i studied also where i pretty much went to every single concert that was local and available so i almost went to i think about 150 concerts in seven years so uh, uh-huh. so a lot of live listening to music from a festival standpoint and from a shall i say a, a venue standpoint but yeah for us obviously i don't know i've, I've i haven't really spoken to the guys as much for, for, for a personal from a personal standpoint i think you know we'd obviously love to do festival tours you know so um, if we can go to europe and do you know a uk tour at festivals i think that'll that'll probably be one of the main goals for the band uh playing from a live standpoint i don't know mm-hmm. Kenny, if yeah, you agree. absolutely no absolutely and also just have the opportunity to to watch all of the other bands um you know out out there so that'll be amazing i think uh for me personally concerts that that that, that have made me come from a very very young age i think i was like 10 or 10 or 11 years old, I went with my dad to a Depeche Mode concert, which was super interesting. And then shortly after, I think I was about 12 years old, Skunk and Nancy was in South Africa and I watched them play and it was absolutely incredible. And I think the just live, loud music like really hooked me in. Um, and over the years, yeah, we've been fortunate enough to have a couple of really amazing bands on our shores. Um, the one that just stands out for me, head above, uh, head and shoulders above any any anything else I've I've went to was the Deftones concert we had here about I think seven or eight years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean I I'm a massive Deftones fan and have been for a very long time and and that for me was so special. It was the most amazing energy um, I had experienced at a concert ever. I was in the marsh pit start to finish, literally drenched in sweat down to my socks. That was just amazing. Trivium and Kill Switch Engage. Yeah, we see yeah, was also yeah, Trivium and Kill Switch Engage. There was Attila, I don't know if you went Attila, to Attila. Attila. Icy yeah. Stars, uh, Ginger also came. Uh, so, so yeah, those are... Bring Me the Horizon. Bring Me the Horizon, actually. Yeah, yeah in our old band. Oh, <laughs> yeah. man. Played we at, played the, at the yeah. festival that they bring me the horizon game, which I was the headline. No, rise against headline. Yeah, rise against bring me the horizon played just before that. Yes. And we actually, our previous band played at that festival, so that was fucking nice. That was yeah, awesome. yeah, we, <laughs> we enjoyed that. And, and and to be honest, at the time, like I wasn't a big bring me the horizon fan, no, I, I didn't no, really no. know them that well. That, that's what they, they were still kind of relatively new and also much, much, much more like death. It's cool. You know, I think that literally they came to South Africa just before the Shadow Moses or Set Return yeah, album dropped. Yeah, before the Set Return. Um, like so suicide, that's quite a long go, you know. Suicide yeah, Suicide Silence. silence. Yeah, it was, uh, silence. was a suicide, suicide, suicide season, season. yes. Yeah, suicide yeah. season was still, yeah, f- fresh in the mind. So so for us, that was, a, that was a nice highlight for us. But yeah, like you said, it's tough here, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The southern point of Africa. Uh, we don't see, yeah, you know, the big bands, international acts. Take note. You know. come, come to us. Um, we'll open for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great suggestion. <laughs> and to give listeners a sense of what to expect when they see your gigs, what can you tell us about? What are they like? High energy. High energy. Um, yeah, so we, we obviously try to get a, a crowd involved in our shows um a lot of what shall i say beats and uh, yeah. an interaction um so i think you know from a doom trigger standpoint um there's no way that someone is going to be standing still you know <laughs> <laughs> you're not just 
admiring. I think we want you to feel the flow of it, um, which naturally obviously means some head banging. You know, the, the first few shows that we've played, uh, the crowd crowd intensity was was crazy. We really didn't expect it to be to be as crazy as it was. Um, so so yeah, obviously we're just gonna try and try and build on that and try and you know let the crowd feel our energy so it so it just gets more intimate. You know, um, I think that's that's probably where we, where, where we'll go. Out of the gigs that you have played, is there a highlight? Is there a a best moment you've had? Um, well, the moments have been, or well, the, the gigs have been, have been few. So uh, we actually just played our third show ever um, two, two weeks ago at Metal for Africa uh, Festival, which was a one-day festival. Uh, that in itself was already a big highlight for us. Um, you know, that is one of the key events on the metal calendar in this country. And we actually got onto that bill before ever playing any shows. So that to us was quite an achievement um, and a kind of a signal of trust from the organizers in the quality of our output to, to, to add us to that bill without even, you know, playing. Without shows. having played anything. Yeah. So, so that was, that yeah. was amazing. And, 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 and on the day, it did not disappoint. It was it was amazing. We actually opened up the first festival, which is a tough slot. Um, yeah. It it started out with a semi-empty floor, and two songs in, it was full front to back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and you know, you could really tell that people were were enjoying it and into it, and the energy was super high. And it, it was amazing because the feedback afterwards was also great, which we obviously appreciate a lot. So uh, we we only played our debut show in June of this year. Um, which was very well received as well from not only the 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 the, the crowd um, but also you know our peers um, you know from from other bands. I think we yeah I think we we made quite an impact uh, um, because we you know well rehearsed and you know because the work work ethic is high. I think the live product is is really good and and matches. And in some cases, is even better than what you hear on 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 the record, um, mm. which is something that's important when you deliver the music in a live setting. Like people will always judge you on like, does it sound like what's on the on the EP or does it sound like what's on the album? And there are certain parts, and and uh, there are a few of our peers that have said this. Uh, in in I think there was also one interview where, where the one guy was like he was listening to one of the parts and and he said. Oof, I wonder how this is going to translate live. You know, admittedly, he said it was it was great. So, you know, when I hear stuff like that, it makes me really happy because it means that we're delivering on what's what's been recorded. You know, it, it's not something that we can't deliver live. So, yeah. Um, and then the other show we played was, uh, you know, at, at a at another band's debut concert, and it was nice to. There were actually two debuts on that night. Mm. So it was nice to just be three brand new bands on a bill at this incredible venue um, just outside of Stellenbosch, our hometown. Again, the turnout was incredible. It was just a great night and good energy. And um, yeah, so I think all of the shows have been have been highlights for us at the moment. But yeah, I would say Middle for Africa was probably the, the biggest one yet. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure the listeners are asking themselves this now, but... Metal for Africa, you know, as you said, you were booked before you'd even played a gig. That's like really being thrown in at the deep end. You must have been <laughs> like crapping yourselves. How did you prepare for it? A little yeah, bit. No, I think, yeah. you know, they they don't really do debuts uh, at, a, at a festival like Metal for Africa. You know, you have relatively, we were very privileged to, to have been, to, you know, to, uh, for them to choose a band that hasn't, hasn't played. So um, I think uh, just obviously from myself and Kenny and, and Frank, uh, our drummer, who obviously has a lot of live experience, I think, you know, I think that's what it's was probably, taken into consideration yeah. before yeah. deciding on whether or not yeah. we, we would be able to play. But, but yeah, I think, um, you know, that... I think if anything, I think Jason probably had the most nerves. I think we were yeah. we were probably a little bit more relaxed because we knew 
what we were kind of getting into and we kind of knew what to expect. Um, this is Jason's first band ever. The debut we played in June was his first live performance ever. Big and ever. He, that's fucking unbelievable yeah. because I was watching him on stage and it was just incredible. Like he was in his element and again, there was resounding feedback from, from that show that people were like, they were blown away that it was... That it, that it you was know, they couldn't Jason's believe first, how it's possible that this, this guy has never <laughs> been in that sort of setup before, you know, yeah. performing whatsoever, yeah. I think. So, yeah. uh, so we super, super yeah, proud so, of him for that. Yeah, he's like, uh, this guy dominates. Man. Yeah, he's, he's, a, nat- <laughs> he's, he's, a, he's a natural. natural. Yeah. Jeez, that's wild. That is nuts. I'm, I doubt there's many other stories like that now. Jeez, I have to try to catch you guys at a gig sometime. I'd say it's... An unbelievable <laughs> experience by the sounds of it. Yeah, that'll be cool. Uh, we're hoping to, yes, we would love to come to Europe and yeah, we want to come to you. Shape or form uh, to, to come perform, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or with dream for the band. Yeah, yeah. I was just going to ask, that's a nice lead into the next question. I was going to ask, looking forward, what needs to happen in your eyes where you'd be like, yeah, we've made it, I'm happy with how it's turned out you know i can sit back and i've built something so i think the first step would be to uh, i guess be recognized as one of the top if not the top metal act in in our own country i think that's the first step and you know i guess what that would look like is be considered for the major metal festivals uh you know get those prime slots or headlining slots. And also when international bands come to tour, like it would be a no brainer, you know, to get us on that bill to open for, for these acts. So, you know, to that end, it would be amazing to be established and renowned as, as one of the top uh, metal acts in the country. And I guess off the back of that, should there be, doors opening from an international point of view to be able to tour and play festivals or shows uh, you know beyond our borders i think that would just tick a major major box for us um mm. you know i know robbie's got a bit of a hit list in terms of what uh, you know international <laughs> festivals he'd like to to play at, but i think if we if we can get there yeah, I would be like, shit, this, this, is, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. to get there achieved. would probably be the, the main, I, I would think, uh, yeah. box tick for tics. this band. Yeah. Any, any um, international festival yeah. that, we can, that we can be a part of would be absolutely incredible. And then obviously just keeping uh, in, in writing and releasing new, new music. Like for me, it's always been about the first objective and port of call is to write and produce and release music that people enjoy and listen to like everything else will spin off from that so that's that's still going to remain important for us but um you know i think playing playing on any international stage would be cherry on top yeah without a doubt but you know as we were saying earlier on in south africa you know there's not that great a scene what is the ceiling in South Africa for you guys before, you know, you need to look international. How far can you actually make it in South Africa before you have to travel abroad? It's a good question. It's a very good question. Uh, <clears throat> things have also changed here um, in terms of uh, platforms to, to be able to do this. Um, venues have closed down. Um, festivals have closed down. Like they, you know, the, the two major ones that we have here for for alternative music is is Ramfest and and Opikopi. Ramfest, Opikopi, uh, cranked up festival and metal for Africa. Up. I would think yeah. with the platforms for metal bands yeah. really to to be able to join bulls. Exactly. Um, uh, Ramfest fell 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 off. Yeah, they're trying to get that. They're trying to get it back. back. Um, and then obviously the Cracked Up Festival was also hasn't started up again yet. Metal for Africa was the first to, to start back up. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think from, from that standpoint, we'd obviously want to play all the all the potential festivals in South Africa. Mm-hmm. 
and um, you know, from an album standpoint, bring out a full album. Um, obviously, we're going in to record a second EP now, but after that, I think the focus will be on a full album. Absolutely. And then, um, obviously, from there, I think you know, there's not much more to be to be reached uh, from a South African standpoint. You know, yeah. the metal community community is a very niche community. And everyone will know already, you know. So, so from 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 that standpoint, then it's time, you know. To, yeah, we just to, have to. to we have to even from 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 now onwards, and that's exactly what we're currently doing: is trying to get international PR and exposure as much as possible. Because <clears throat> even if you do reach the ceiling here in in SA, like we've got to keep building, you know, our, our kind of our name and. Um, footprints across the rest of the globe where, where possible. Otherwise, you're also not going to be able to unlock those, those international experiences. So I think there's a job to be done here with, yes, we want to do, we want to do the festivals here, the major festivals. We, we do want to be kind of known and, uh, um, and seen as one of the, the top metal acts in, in this country. But there's a continuous job to be done on the international side of things, like we continuously have to also push for PR abroad, even from now on. Um, you know, it's not it's not something like are we first going to do, you know, within our borders and then we'll go beyond. It it it, it all needs to be one big all encompassing effort, which is kind of what we what we're trying to do, um, you know, from the get go. Yeah, yeah, and as such a new band, you know, it's a. Uh... You know, with social media and everything, it's an absolute nightmare. I've had conversations about it in the past, but as a new band, how do you approach growing the band and getting your name out there to new listeners? <laughs> That's, uh, That's really I'm cool. not going to lie. There's so much stuff out there. It's, it's just almost impossible to, to really feature. Um, but I think, obviously, um, usually when there's something to to read as well as listen to that makes a big difference because a lot of stuff is just thrown out there and people obviously want to get the music out there but if nothing has been written about that specific music then usually it just you know it people click next yeah. uh, uh, unless there's something uh, has been said about it or you've been seen on a either a live concert or on a bill or on a t-shirt or on something, you know, some for, form of, shall I say, marketing. Um, from that standpoint, uh, I think that's that's probably the better way to get the music out there for a new band than just to get it out there. Get, just to just release the music means nothing, you know. Yeah, so, yeah absolutely. So, yeah, it's kind of a whole ecosystem that has to play uh, together. Um, you know, there's a social media channels, there's, you know, posting content on those channels and keeping them active. And there's, you know, doing merch and making that available to people that, that want it. You know, that in turn is, is, is getting rep out, out on the street when someone wears shit, shit, what is that? What's Doom Trigger? You know, what does that mean? What, oh, it's a band. Oh, okay, yeah, go listen to them. Word of mouth, um, PR reviews. Um, you have to keep trying to push you know, from 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 all the channels possible uh, and and at your disposal, um, it, it's something that's really difficult to do independently. Um, mm. Like there's, there's a lot of of moving parts, um, and so specifically from the PR side, um, we were approached by by Warren Gibson from Plug Music Agency to assist us from from a PR point of view to get some opportunities for reviews and, and interviews and just to kind of you know, heighten the awareness around the, the band and our music, um, which is the, the channel that we've had a little bit of help, uh, which has been awesome. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of the stuff we do all independently. So again, like it's a lot of hard work and slog, um, but you, know, you just got to do it. You just got to do it. That's the thing as well. You know, you always do need a good team behind you or, you know, if you don't have the team, the individual members you need to kind of just the same as writing music you need to kind of push together and you know work at it just as hard as the lyrics absolutely um and it would be amazing if we could get to a point where we've got more people on board 
you know, as a team to help us with these kind of things. I would, I would love to get someone just to handle all the social media. I would love to get a dedicated photographer uh, to come to come shoot the the shows to you know do concept shoots for us to generate some some good quality content as well for PR packs for social channels. Um, it's so important. Like you can't you can't take one photo that for three years as an example you can't you know take a video of one breakdown at a, at a show and and use that for 15 posts uh, you, it's, it's so tricky you've got to just stay stay fresh um and and, and keep kind of producing um content <laughs> to, to try to cut through all of the noise mm. yeah definitely definitely and I can't believe I didn't ask at the start because I'm sure people are wondering where did Doom Trigger, the name, come from? <laughs> yeah, so that that's that's something that I kind of just conceived from thinking about a a moment or an occurrence that sets off a sequence of unfortunate or impactful events, like almost. You know, we all know what the butterfly effect is. Yeah. Um, so it's almost like setting off a, a butterfly effect, but that moment, the thing or the trigger that's that sets that off, um, it is kind of what what doom trigger means and and is. And you know, because because the the concept behind the, the, the most of the songs and the first EP and also going into the second EP is very much based on human experiences and you know how to how to deal with them uh, negative uh, socio political impacts um, you know kind of topics like that I think the name is very uh, apt for for the for the actual lyrical and conceptual material that that sits within the within the music. So so Doom Trigger essentially is 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 a moment of of impact that that sets off uh, an occurrence of events. Um, I guess it kind of speaks to you know people need to be very aware of of their actions because it's got a it's got a lasting impact on whatever you know uh, yeah. some personal experiences. Um, yeah, I think it's quite a broad, broad thing. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it all makes sense now, though. It's a great name, but, you know, as you said, as you mentioned, the lyrics, the, the music, it's the perfect package. You guys really do have the perfect package, you know, fits together so well. Oh, wow. Cool, thanks. Thanks, oh, man. No, that's very appreciated. And before we get to the last set of questions, then, what can you tell the listeners about the upcoming EP? Um, yes, it's a tough one. I think, um, <clears throat> like Kenny said, um, a little bit more input. Uh, so there's going to be a bit more variety, I think. Uh, a, little bit, a little bit faster. Definitely faster um, than, than what the first, first EP was. And then, obviously, we do have a guy that writes, um, you know, the synth background for us um so yeah he's uh, from what we've learned from the first ep uh, in terms of where we can use it how we can use it uh, has grown a lot so we'll obviously put that into effect also uh, yeah. on the second ep um but i think it's going to be heavy i think people are going to like it i think absolutely uh, you know, Absolutely. we, we uh, a lot of the stuff is also goes very well live, you know, so all the tracks that will be on this EP works in a live environment. So obviously you're going to get some good breakdowns and, you know, some some quick riffs. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're excited. We're very excited to, to, to just uh, hear the stuff, even for ourselves, you know, just. Yeah, because we've only, we've only been now. playing it live. Uh, and in rehearsal, so we, we haven't heard it, you know, tracked uh, and mixed and mastered. So we we also very excited for the for the end, end product. And it'll also it'll be definitely four tracks, potentially five tracks. Uh, depends on how quickly I can put together this last little little track that I have <laughs> in my pocket. But we've completed writing the four tracks, which will definitely go into studio with um, and and. And yeah, hopefully it comes out as good as, as we're expecting it to. 
and the title of the EP will be Dark Continuum. Um, uh-huh. And we'll, I, I won't reveal too much about, about the origin of the name, um, but we'll, 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 when we do the release, we'll support it with a release pack and, and give a little bit more insight into the origin of the name and the uh, conceptual um, you know, ideas behind the, the songs and everything like that. Ah. Sounds great. I have to admit, though, the name of the albums, they would work perfectly for, like, I don't know, Marvel superhero films as well, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. Um, it's, it's so funny. When, 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 we, when we first started, um, when, before we had Frank on the drums, uh, Frank, uh, Etienne's nickname is Frank, so we call him, affectionately call him Frank. Um, we had another friend of ours just kind of sessioning on the drums um, and, and he actually said the music sounds like music that gamers would listen to when they locked into playing games um, you know which was also it was like, interesting it was quite an interesting <laughs> comment yeah actually I can definitely see that actually yeah yeah I hadn't thought about that but it would be next time I'm playing Grand Theft Auto now I'm going to Give the record a spin and see how well it, it sinks <laughs> up to it. Surfing. See if the theory checks out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. We'll uh we'll move on to the last set of questions. So everybody gets these, I'm afraid. So you can't get off the podcast till you answer. If there was if there was an artist or performer from history you could see for one night only in concert, who would it be? Metallica. Very, very easy answer for me. <laughs> Gary Moore. Ah, right, right. Metallica, I've heard a few times. I've never heard Gary Moore as an answer. That guy's my hero. That guy's literally, I think if somebody would ask me who's your who's your idol in terms of guitaring, I would say Gary Moore. Yeah, yeah. And he's one of them guys. I don't even need to ask why. Yeah, exactly. And I mean you said Mm. Metallica, so Metallica covered a Thin Lizzy song. Whiskey yeah. and Star, Gary Moore was a guitarist of Thin Lizzy. Uh, so that just shows the influence that guy had. Look, I mean, it's about, he, he went from playing in a, in, in, in a, in a rock slash metal band, Thin Lizzy, and, you know, went on to his solo career and the type of music that guy writes and his guitaring ability for me is just incredible. Second to none, like really... Yeah, just super talented. You know, I think uh, for myself, you know, Metallica was definitely growing up. It was the only thing that existed, really. Yeah. Uh, you know, you had a, a small little grunge era where I didn't listen to, to metal yet. Um, I only found it late in my later years. But uh, um, Metallica stands out for me, um, you know, I think from let's say early teens, still early twenties. It's a good 15 year period was, was the only thing that existed for me, you know? So uh, I I threw some other stuff in there, but, but they were the only thing, not not so much anymore, to be honest. Um, I mean, I love still the coverage that they get and, but I don't listen to their music as actively as I used to. I listen to a lot, a a lot, a lot heavier stuff now. (laughs) So they are, yeah, they they the ones that started it. No, they're the legends, yeah. absolute legends. Yeah, yeah. I always feel like with Metallica, I seen them in concert two years ago and they were unreal. But I kind of feel like when you're growing up and you discover Metallica, you think they're a lot heavier than they are. You know, like compared yeah. to bands yeah, nowadays, yeah. like they're almost the pop music of metal. Pretty know? much yeah. now, yeah. 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 And the craziest part is if you... You know, if you l- see that 89 Seattle show on DVD, which everyone is raves about, I mean, that's just epic beyond proportion. I mean, that that's where these guys were, in my personal opinion, were absolutely in their element mm-hmm. at the right age. And also the en- energy is so high. It's just absolutely incredible. Obviously, it's not the same anymore. But, uh, but yeah, I think, uh, like you say, uh, in today's terms, it's light. You know, it is very, very light. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, we've. Uh, I think, for, especially myself. I don't know from Kenny. Kenny always had a little hard edge on him. Uh, <laughs> no, but but for, my, for myself, the 
the the loud stuff came I would say in the last 10 years and it's just gotten heavier every time. Yeah. Every, every new edition is just heavier, heavier. So. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I definitely started started off Metallica, creeping death album, head banging in my friend's bedroom. Uh but yeah, very quickly went on to the likes of Pantera, Sepultura, Soulfly. Um and then came the new metal era with you know, with with Death Tones, Corn. Bullets for my Valentine. Bullets for my Valentine. Yeah, so it, it, it did just go heavier and heavier. You're right. Uh, look, but I mean, the guys like like Metallica and, and um, all the bands in those era, Megadeth, Megadeth, Anthrax, they they paved the way for what what all of us do today. You know, yes, it's just incredible. Really has changed now. Right? It really has changed. The music yeah. has adapted quite far from that. Yeah. 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 Leaps and bounds, you would uh, Jesus, yeah. it's like a totally different genre nowadays, yeah, yeah. completely, yeah, completely. yeah. And the next one, so if you had to spend 24 hours locked inside a room with any artist or performer from history, who would it be? Wow, <laughs> because that's incredibly tough. I'll probably have to, I think I have to. Mine would definitely be James Hetfield, obviously. Um, That's what I would say. But I think someone that that is not from my era, I would say Elvis Presley. Oh, yes. I, would I say wasn't Elvis. expecting that. Great one. Wow. Great one. Um, I would probably say Dave Grohl. Right. J- just because of the, the vastness of his career and obviously the the kind of Nirvana days transitioning into the Foo Fighters days. And also like, you know, what that poor guy has gone through in terms of loss, especially with the recent Taylor Hawkins loss as well. Like shit, man, mm. plays in Nirvana, like loses, you know, Kurt Cobain, band member and best friend, goes on to form the Foo Fighters, massively successful, loses best friend and, and bandmate Taylor. Like shit. Yeah, that's it. Fuck, that's yeah. it. You couldn't actually make it up, you know? Yeah, so you couldn't make it up. And he is such a positive entity. Like, he just seems to take it in his straight. I just think it's, it takes a very special kind of personality and, and strong strong person to, to be able to overcome things like that, you know? Yeah. I think that could make for a good few hours of conversation. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I have to ask, what do you think Foo Fighters will do next? I wonder. I wonder. They still have some years in them. So yeah. I don't think it's going to stop. Yeah. Um, probably, I wonder if they will get session guys to come in from maybe. other big bands maybe. Um, to, to, to maybe play on the drums for yeah. any specific show. You know, um, I think also knowing Dave Grohl and, and the kind of things he gets up to, I wouldn't be surprised if they did like a tribute record for, for Taylor, which might include like half finished songs or, you know, song ideas that Taylor had, because he obviously is, he was a big, big input in songwriting as well for them. It's not, it's not all Dave Grohl. So mm-hmm. yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if there's like some sort of a tribute record for, for him, which would be amazing. Um, but yeah, I think, I think they probably will, like Robbie said, get some session drummers and keep playing shows. Um, I think that's also what the majority of the fans would want. Um, you know, you do get the purists that would say, no, it's disrespectful. You can't, you can't do that. Um, but you've got to serve, you've got to serve the fans at the end of the day, you know, and exactly. it's not out of disrespect for, for, for Hawkins. It's, it's actually out of respect. And it's, I guess, I guess it, if, if, if they were intending to play for another 10 years, and unfortunately, you know, one of them have passed away. They would still want to fulfill that dream because that's what the band collectively wanted to do. And they need to uphold that. So I wouldn't be surprised if they still played for. Yeah. And also, I think it would be, it would be a, a shitty decision to not play the music. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. So it's obviously what people want. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I kind of feel like Dave Grohl is the type of person where he physically wouldn't be able to stop making mood yeah, music, yeah, you know? yeah, he'd have to just keep like going. But I also have a theory. I think, you know, as you said, the session musicians, and I think in a couple of years time, they'll at least offer the position to Taylor's son. 
Yeah, that would I be. Wonder, that I would wonder be if they'll, they'll, they'll consider that. Yeah. Um, very young, the age difference might be yeah. like coming to play, obviously. But you know, seeing that they, I don't think they're going to find a full-time guy. I honestly think they'll do guys, which means that you know, his son will definitely have opportunities to play with him. Maybe they'll like use his son on the records. You know, maybe he'll be yeah. in the studio. Uh, studio, yeah. Um, it's, but, you know, I think for the live shows, yeah, I, I don't think they're going to stick with one guy, to be honest. Yeah, I think I, they're going to, they, they'll probably, they'll probably mix it up. Mix it up, yeah. Yeah, yeah, probably. And just to jump back to your answer, totally get James Hetfield, but why Elvis? I wasn't expecting that at all. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? <laughs> I mean, the king. Yeah. So, yes. To be honest, I, I, I never uh, growing up had an interest whatsoever um, in Elvis. I listened to a lot of Beatles when when I was very young. I mean, now I'm saying under twelve years old. So, so Beatles. Uh, but uh, recently, um, Elvis has come up on random occasions. Um, so much so that, you know, when my firstborn was young, Elvis, you know, I played Elvis for her all the time, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, to bed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 and, and from that, so I, I did a little more research on the guy and listened to most of his stuff, you know, and, you know, that folksy old school rock and roll vibe still, it's a lot of people going, obviously. A lot of people, or most people, still know it. You know, it's getting so old now that people probably don't know who's singing it, but they know the song, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, Elvis really, really uh, eats the nail on the head there for me. Um, and obviously, that personality. I mean, I think yeah. that personality was larger than life and probably one of the largest the world has ever seen. <laughs> Um, which is probably one of the reasons why I put his name out there. Yeah, yeah. I am. Um, I'm a massive Elvis fan. Like since I was, I'd say seven or eight years of age, I was collecting his records and everything. But so much so that I feel like listeners, when a guest mentions Elvis, I feel like listeners at this stage, are like, oh, don't get him started on Elvis now. We've heard <laughs> enough. But no, I love that you mentioned Elvis. I really wasn't That's expecting funny. it. That's so funny. That's funny. And we'll move on to the next question, the final question. If there was a song to appear on the soundtrack to your life, what would it be? Best of Puppets. Yeah. you're really quick off the mark with these that's answers quick. no that that that, that would be, oh, that's very easy for me so uh I, before it was it started to get this commercial appeal again um you know through the i think the stranger stranger things stranger things yeah commercialized the appeal for master of puppets of master of puppets you can ask anyone in my family if they all see a song right and describe lobby they'll say immediately it'll be master of puppets you know <laughs> but, um yeah, I just think that's probably the best metal song ever written. Uh, it's not going to change yeah, for me no, anytime no. soon. So, yeah. Can't argue with that. Very difficult question. <laughs> um, I'd probably say Madness from Muse. Wow, that's interesting. I've been listening to that quite a bit also. Yes, that's a great song. Yes, I also like it actually. And I think it's just... It's, it's based on lyrical content and also just the song build up and that fucking ending. It's just so, so epic. It's, it's, so it's interesting such concept. an emotional and incredible piece of music. Uh, yeah. yeah, I think, I think. I, Yo, and we don't really listen to Muse too often, I gotta be honest, but there's time, I go through Muse phases also. Yeah, <laughs> Them and I yeah. to them for like where you get like, you know, where we go through a yeah. new space. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> my, my vocal tone kind of yeah, suits you can do Matthew that, Bellamy yeah. vibe quite well. So it's it's also one of the, the the bands that I like, I'll sing to most frequently in the car and stuff like that. So, uh -huh. um, but yeah, that song is just absolutely beautiful. I absolutely love that song. Uh, two very good picks. So, right, guys. It's been an absolute blast. I've really enjoyed chatting to you now for the last hour and thanks a million for coming on. Yeah, no, thanks a lot. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much, man. Really enjoyed it. Thank you.
I am Matthew Thomas, the Spirit of Super Cool Radio, and if you're looking for a great podcast that features the best independent and up-and-coming bands and artists, then check out my podcast, Super Cool Radio. Each week, I deliver fun interviews, and every Friday, I spin some killer music. 
You might not know some of these bands that I feature, but I guarantee you will love them. Check out Super Cool Radio on YouTube, Rumble, Anchor, Spotify, iTunes, or the streaming platform of your choice. Tune in and rock out. Hey guys, I really hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please rate and review us on iTunes and Spotify. And if you're interested in signing up the Band Builder Academy, use the link in the show notes below and enter the code CONCERTS and you'll receive 10% off. So, until next time, keep rocking. Hey, hey, what are you guys still doing here? The show is over. It's over. You can go home. Go on. We'll see you next time. We'll be here. Bye.